Boyd Scott. It's ASMR time. It's midnight. It's always midnight. <laughs> I'm, uh, oh, no, I did it. The camera didn't light up. For some reason, the recording was interrupted there. So, back on. I think, I hope. And we are reading with Ruby. There's Ruby. Also got the Ruby cam running, which I've got down here pointing at her. Hello, Ruby. I'll show a pan. Look, there's a pan. Oh, some live action. Chewing your foot. Are you chewing your foot? Hello. Ruby does tricks, of course, so got a bit of a nice treat for you here. With poppers, pop, pop, poplars, poplars from Futurama. That's what that is from the telly. Uh, Ruby likes them, don't you? Ooh, ooh, what's that? What are you gonna do? What'd you say? What'd you say? Ooh. What'd you say? What'd you say? What'd you, ooh. What'd you say? Ooh. What'd you say? Ooh. Recorded by Morley, of course, in 3D sound. What'd you say? What is that you said? Yeah? Did you want this poplar? Do you want the poplar? What'd you say? What'd you say? What'd you say? Did you say bad man? Yeah? Did you say bad man? <laughs> um, I'll let you into a little secret. Ruby's... She's naughty really, because what she's done today... Can't you find it? You do it for her. What she's done today is she's been eating, I think she had a little bit of chocolate or something. It's only one it's supposed to have, and it's made her feel a little bit. <laughs> I think she's tripping balls, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, she seems quite, you know, she seems quite alright, don't worry about it. Um, she's a little devil. She eats all sorts of things that she's not supposed to have. Uh, a lot of things are toxic to dogs. Like chocolate or beans or I don't know, but um, little bookos there on camera, little bookos. Okay, Ruby, we're just gonna do some reading with Ruby. She's happy. Oh, yeah, you're a good girl there. Yeah, you're a good girl. I'm gonna read the book. If you can hear some shouting. It's because my neighbours uh, seem to be having some sort of party or fight, <laughs> depending on how it's going. Um, there's a part of me wants to go and stand in the garden and eavesdrop. Another part of me wants to go out there and shout, shut up, but then that would be hypocritical, wouldn't it? Um, another part of me wants to read this book, Whisper Town. And if you remember, we were up to chapter three. <laughs> We've done two parts, and it's not my most popular series. It's not my most popular set of videos. Uh, a few more of my videos are. Um, I can't help it. I'm gonna have to go and find out. I'm just gonna have to go and find out. You say you're in my camera.
they close their curtains and close their windows. So <laughs> that's the end of that. I hope. But yeah, this isn't my most popular series, and I can see why. Um, my usual, what I usually do is whisper and create ASMR triggers. What I'm doing here is much more, it's supposed to be much more freeform, much more relaxed. But now that I'm committed to Whisper Town, uh, there's a little more pressure on me to finish it. <laughs> So ironic, and uh, yeah, it's like some ASMR artists are reading some quite good books. Um, in my, one of my review pieces, I'll probably do a book review, ASMR book corner, and show you some of the other wonderful ASMR artists who are reading some really good books. I've chosen to read something quite, quite bad. Whisper Town, a red badge mystery novel by Judson Phillips. It's a book that looks like it was put together. Um, by a crazed fan and uh, written on the train on the way to a meeting about something more important is the feel I get from it although probably Judson Phillips did try and put every detective cliche in there to um, fit the form and type of, of the book but I don't know anyway so we're on to chapter 3 and um, because, like I said, I feel <laughs> it's not maybe the best story, and I am committed to it, I'm going to give it a good go now, at reading through some of it. Um, we'll see if I stop to interject. The more I do, the longer it will take. So, Rudy comes to Orion. Rudy's giving it the wobbles, aren't he? Look. Oh, she feels good to that. They come out them shafts and they, you know, fun time. Anyway, because it is, you know, midnight, it's like way past, so. The accident on Cobbs Hill was not the first kind of murder. Do you remember the accident? You can always check back in the videos, can't you? And my intent for this series is that <laughs> people might, in the, in the long run, when I finish the book, you might be able to just come and, you know, listen to it all in one go. A bit like how I watched Game of Thrones recently. Which I thought was, um, which we won't talk about. So, yeah, maybe you could just go and read it. Sorry, listen to it all in one go. That means I have to finish it. I'm flicking through it now. It's quite a long book. It's done 215 pages of this. So, the accident on Cobbs Hill was not the first kind of murder in which Sarah Woodling had been involved. He lived for nearly 35 years. Oh, really? Didn't he? <laughs> we'll get there. We'll, we'll get there. He had lived for nearly 35 years with the shadow of another death hanging over his head. In certain sleepless moments, he could hear an old woman's voice screaming at him. I'm not going to scream at you. Uh, but she screams murderer, and no one else had heard it. No one in Rock City had thought of it as murder. No one, that is, except Alton Graves. Most people sympathised with Sayer. Old timers excused his heavy drinking over the years. Never recovered from the blow of finding her dead, they said. Or well, they did it in the American accent, didn't they? So, uh, as in the other episodes, um, <laughs> never recovered from the blow of finding her dead. Or some. Yeah. Do you know what? Tonight, I think everyone could be French. Just looking ahead, first time. There's not really what I was talking, actually. I was a little bit there. I listened to it. Okay, everyone could be French. So they have never recovered from the blow of finding her dead, they said. He had never married again, a symbol to the public mind that he had been deeply devoted to Francis. He had not been devoted to her, he had hated her, and so the sense of guilt never left him. Now, added to that, would be the vision of a greening tail light, remember that? And the girl's scream, the smell of roasting flesh. It's not very nice, this. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> The Woodlings and the Sayers had lived in Rock City since its incorporation as a town back in 1740. We're getting a bit of a history lesson now. Thomas Woodling had been a lawyer in the Revolutionary War days, a member of the first state legislature. His sons had followed in his footsteps. There had been a Woodling in the Governor's Mansion, a Woodling in Congress, a state Supreme Court judge, 
Vincent would link to say his father had settled down in what was now a flourishing small city to make money out of the law as an advisor to the rich, counsel to corporations. He married Emily Sayer. She's, uh, so, so he married Emily Sayer and used her surname to name his son, Sayer Woodling. He married Emily Sayer of the wealthy Sayer Lumber Interests. They were solid, morally, socially, financially. And Sayer Woodling is like a double-barreled surname and he just goes by his surname as a first name. Like people get confused, they just think it was his surname, so um, that would be a mistake, wouldn't it? I don't know many people who are named after their mother's maiden name. They were solid morally, socially, financially. Vincent and Emily Woodling had only one child. Sir Woodling was the last of a long line of Woodlings and much depended on his future. Also, I'm quite aware of just... Oh, Ruby Cam went. Um, you want to get your close-ups, Ruby? Really? Any close-ups? There you are. Let's give it a little fix. That's what they do in the movies so they can edit things together and see where the sound goes and shit. Sir Woodling was the last of a long line of Woodlings. I am going to try and read the story tonight, I am, I promise. Um, Sir Woodling was the last of a long line of Woodlings and much depended on his future, his marriage, his project. I was just about to say actually that I was aware that when I read, I look down and sometimes I can get all a bit close into the camera like this. And when you're just looking at a part of my face in the iPhone camera, then it kind of distorts it slightly. And I, would rather I sit back a little and you can um, get a more realistic picture of my face. And last time I had a real problem with this reading the Ruby piece because I'm recording on the iPhone, which is what I use as the eyepiece to this dummy head arrangement. Um, yeah, it, it, so, you know, I work in the media a little bit, I do some sound recording, I make some films, and uh, like really small time at the moment I'm just trying to get that off the ground a bit I love doing it obviously I make these films for you guys and through that and I did an HND in media when I was at college um, so I know a bit about media production I always want to get back into doing it a bit yeah. Um, so yeah but recording on my iPhone is not the most professional setup but for the binaural head it works as a um, I already have an iPhone I'm not selling iPhones I already had a phone that has a camera, so I could use it quite easily as the eye for the dummy head, which is something I wanted to do. Uh, create an eyepiece for it that didn't change the nature of the, the dummy head too much, but really I need to upgrade that to something better, because apparently uh, the, eye, the phone captures movie uh, at slightly differing frame rates it's a bit boring and what happens is when I come to link it up and sync it up uh, it goes out of time and it becomes really annoying for me in the edit so if tonight my voice and my picture go a little out of time and I get too frustrated to correct it all you'll know that's what's happened and I promised I was going to get on with reading the book much depended on his future his marriage, his progeny. It was unthinkable the Woodlings should die out. Sayer, brother, oh, I look unto Rupins. Look unto Rupins, you're a good girl. Sayer, born in 1896, was a handsome boy, a source of pride to his father, much admired by his mother. Later, when he was able to evaluate, Sayer was much admired by himself. The pattern of Sayer's life, I thought it was quite a cheeky little nun. The pattern of Sayer's life was arranged for him before his personal interests involved much more than three meals a day and the problems of early toilet training. He'd go to Rock City Academy, to the State University, and finally to Columbia Law School. Is there such a place as Rock City? Oh, that would be a cool ass place to get your mail sent to. <laughs> to have on your address. Care of Rock City. Um, Rock City Academy to the State University to finally to Columbia Law School. He would then join his father and a new sign would be painted on the office door. Vincent Woodling and son. 
except for the interruption of World War I, for which Sarah emerged unscathed as a very young captain of infantry. Everything went according to plan. So he's written a proper backstory for Sarah here. He doesn't just chuck characters around like Mrs. Timothy. And that's, I wonder if she's got this depth of, of story. Because, yeah, the World War I. Sarah had been captain of the Rock City Academy football team. At state, he'd been mentioned as an alternate All-American tackle by Walter Camp. He graduated with adequate marks and the designation of handsomest man in his class and most likely to succeed. Sounds like a real... real he ends up all... Blah, 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 didn't he? All saggy and crap. <laughs> um, he certainly was good-looking. Six foot two, flat-stomached, hard-muscled, and with a kind of old-worldly cunt. <laughs> Sorry, <clears throat> country was the word. He didn't have it, an old world. Anyway, he looked, and with a kind of old world courtly charm. So it wasn't even country, it was courtly. An old world courtly charm in public that had the mothers of eligible young Rock City girls dreaming dreams about him. So basically, he's, he's, he's a bit of a, a fitty. <laughs> so now the internet room, he just said a bit of his blow, a bit of a fitty. So. In my uh, work on the internet, I do want to uh, remain fairly... Well, I want to put my personality across, you know, but I want to remain fairly ambiguous on some aspects. So we'll probably cut all that. So anyway, yeah, he's a... Uh, old Vincent Woodling kept his son adequately provided with money, and Emily Woodling secretly added to her son's allowance. It wasn't that Vincent believed that young men should be lavishly kept, but that no woodling should ever appear to have less than anyone else in the world. There were rich men's sons at State, and there would be rich men's sons at Columbia. Sarah should cut no lesser figure than the best. Sarah accepted his plush existence with a lazy, good-natured affability. He was never snooty, having an enemy in the world, and there are those who remember him as, a generous, and as generous and sympathetic to the less fortunate. At law school, Sarah did moderately well. He wasn't a real student, but he was facile. He had a command of language and an unusual facile. I thought facile, I mean, dictionary time. I've got the computer here, so he's going to find what facile means. Because I didn't think it fit in that context like that. Facile. Facile. Ignoring the true complexities of an issue, superficial, of success, especially in sport, easily achieved, a facile seven-length victory. Yeah, I, know, I thought it meant something to do with easy. So, in his context, why was he... He wasn't a real student, but he was facile. He had a kind of language and an unusual short-term memory for facts. Superficial, but he was faster. Right, the way I read it is he wasn't a real student, but he was superficial. So it should really read he wasn't a real student, comma, he was facile. He had a command of language and an unusual short term memory for facts. Examinations held no terrors for him, even though he might not retain the knowledge later on. When he came home for vacations, old Vincent Woodman had only two questions. Are you, because he's going to be French for us, are you getting by all right? <coughs> are you getting uh, by all right? Uh, are you uh, all right uh, in your getting uh, by? How are, how are you doing? Are you okay? Are you okay? How are you doing? Are you okay? Hey, come, come, are you okay? You're okay. How are you doing? How are you? Hey, how are you doing? Yeah. Are you okay? Do you need anything? Is there anything you need? He would ask of him. Is there anything that I can do for you? Uh, Emily would be dreamed of what it would have been like to be married to someone like her charming son. Until his second year uh, in the uh, school of law, say had no secrets from his family. It uh, led him to believe he was not secretive. Uh, the truth was there had never been anything of uh, any consequence for him to hide from them until he met uh, Lucy Tanner in the speakeasy uh, 
the speakeasy was a flourish, a flourishing institution in 1920, sell so had acquired a mild taste for liquor in the army, and even so highly moral a person as his father disapproved of the Volstead Act, which must be the one where they have um, stopped the drinking uh, in uh, America, the uh, prohibition, um, prohibition was a thing where they are no drinking and it is enforceable by a law and what happened was there were gangsters and they took control over the black market and people were still drinking, they were exercising their freedoms and their rights to choose what they want to uh, consume um, and they were still drinking and in fact more speakeasies existed during this time than there are bars now in America um, is a fact I have heard. Yeah, I may have made it up, I am not sure I made this up. But it's a similar principle. Anyway, you can understand the point. There is a lot of drinking still happening during this time, and the gangsters, uh, Al Capone, I think, is a famous example. Uh, um, they were making all this money, and they were, uh, they were feeding. They were feeding of the... Oh, we have lost Rubicam again, but I am talking about this subject, so I will carry on for a minute. They were feeding off this black market that was created by the prohibition, and eventually uh, America had decided this was no longer a plan, and that uh, the uh, enforcement of the law was costing more, and was an unwinnable fight, and that people were still uh, buying the alcohol, the drug. Um, uh, it was just in the hands of the black marketers, so they were able to uh, make an inferior product, maybe uh, it could be like lighter fuel or, you know, oh, it would uh, burn your eyes and make you poorly, um, but still sell and uh, make them, um, you know, lots of money. So, I um, mean, very much how the war on drugs is being approached and approached differently in different places, maybe now in America, but um, it is very much as the war on drugs, you know, we pile a lot of money into prevention and into um, the policing of a, a prohibition, but it is not uh, effective and the black market means that drugs are freely, freely available, but they are also being pushed by people who have um, guns and prostitution and other black markets that they are involved with, and this drug uh drug money is fueling um, more evils so it may simply be the case that uh, i'm not saying that we want to have junkies walking around everywhere but what i am saying is that uh, it may be a case that to control the supply you have to um, accept that there is supply and uh, take control through legitimacy so uh, in the same way we have many many dangerous things you know, you can buy a gun, you can buy uh, um, alcohol, is a killing, is a killing drug. Oh, yes, I am sorry, Ruby, we are not talking about Whisper Town. We are talking in French about prohibition and the drug, <laughs> drug rules. But uh, I, I will get back, well, let's turn you on. Yes, where is your camera? Where is, where is Ruby Cam? How are you feeling? Are you okay? Feeling a bit poorly. Feeling a bit poorly. She is on board. She is, she is a bloody, a bloody trip, trip out today, aren't you? Eh? You have been eating the wrong things. You have been on the stealing. It was it a chocolate coated raisin? Or was it a mini little raisin mini coated with chocolate? They are bad for the dogs. They are toxic. Um, and uh, what will happen is. Uh, for example, for example, many dangerous things are available, but they are controlled. You have to have a license, you have to uh, um, go to some tests. I mean, we, we have cars. Everyone can just jump and drive a car. You have to take a test. You have to have a license before you can drive a car. And it, it does prevent people from driving when they are not allowed. They, people are not driving without the license. You know, they are going to get the license. So... Um, it is our way of uh, uh, control, and ultimately, people should be free to make their choices. You know, they should be free, and we sell many, many drugs to people in many forms that are socially normal, 
like alcohol or coffee. I know coffee has been out for a bit too late dog. And also dog companies who are not selling drugs for pleasure maybe, but um, there is a debate on how pleasurable uh, and no, no, I will not get into that. Anyway, the drug companies are another story. But um, let us say, for example, you know, you can go to a shop and you are over the age of 21 and you have completed some awareness course or something like this and you want to buy a, a narcotic, a narcotic that is uh, uh, made safe, uh, produced in a laboratory conditions, and you are willing to pay the heavy tax for this. I do not want to... Uh, create a model here where drugs are freely on sale and there are bad things in the world but the drugs are freely on sale today you know you can go and buy these drugs today so uh, i'm not changing the fact that they are free and they're not free you have to pay but i'm not changing the fact that they are available they are already available on the black market i'm just legitimizing it controlling it and uh, then of course making a lot of money from the the industry which already makes a lot of money and then you are saving the money because you are not policing the uh, the criminals, and you can use this money to uh, police <laughs> proper, uh, you know, uh, real criminals, and to take them um, for real crimes. And it would seem sensible that the money that comes back through the legitimacy of drugs would therefore fund things like schools and education, so that people would choose not to want to take drugs. And in the same with alcohol, you know, people should not be drinking in the quantities they are drinking. Uh, yet, uh, little is done to control this, but much is done to, um, to fuel the industry. Uh, morals are not important here. What is important is that the fact, the fact that drugs are on sale, and we are pretending that it is better that we are chasing our tails when in actual fact it would be better to um, to reap a, uh, to bring a profit uh, to create an, an econ the economy is already there to control the economy the black market economy for drugs and then also if you have people coming to you because they have a role in addiction you know they have an addiction they will not give up the drug because um, it is expensive. They go and they steal. So many people, many people have problems with this sort of thing. By bringing them in through your clinic where the drugs are available through the government, um, by legitimizing them, by decriminalizing them, by um, licensing them, you then have people coming to you. You know, you can help them. You can provide them with a means to get off the drug. You know, you can help them. It is only a thought anyway, it's a thought I have many times. I am confused why we waste our time and our money. And our money. Ah, that the law. The speakeasy was a, flourishing, was a flourishing institution in 1920. Sarah had acquired a mild taste for liquor in the army, and even so highly moral a person as his father disapproved and bolstered at. Drinking, though it was against the law, was not frowned on in Rock City and certainly not in New York. Liquor prices were scandalously high, but a sailor's lavish double allowance permitted him to go to some of the plush places. Now there was a secret that Sarah had kept from his father, one that would have astonished old Vincent. At the age of 24, with two years of army service overseas behind him, Sarah Woodling had never, as his father would have said, known a woman. Uh, I'm surprised he wouldn't even, you know, why he's, um, I suppose it's the 60s, but I'm surprised that he's so uh, coy about the, the matter of sex when he's quite happy to talk about um, alcoholism and murder <laughs> in the first two chapters. Now there was a secret, yeah. He had been confronted by a good many opportunities, but always at the moment of crisis, the prospects seem a little comic to him <laughs> and a little vulgar. I don't know what he's describing by the moment of crisis, because... And it doesn't, and, and it seems that, so to Sarah Woodling, the idea of sex with a woman uh, is a crisis, it's a moment of crisis, and seems comical, seems funny to him. 
and vulgar. I can understand the vulgarity. Uh, we're taught that th certain things are vulgar, despite them being very natural. Um, I don't know why he's been taught this. Well, then, yeah, I suppose the idea could be seen, could seem comic, couldn't it? What a waste, eh? He's supposed to be a hulking, <laughs> flat stomach, tired, muscled, old world, courtly charm, six foot two, best looking in his class, never got any. <laughs> not the promiscuity is the way to go, you know. I'm not, I'm not saying that if you look good, have sex with people, that's not what I'm saying. I was just putting things in context of the way the Western world seems to see things, which, you know, some people might think is pretty abhorrent, and that Sarah Woodling keeping himself pure for the right person you know, was a, a very good thing even if you did think that it was vulgar and comical. <sighs> Periodically she'd advised him that if he could resist temptation and eventually go clean in mind and body to the woman he loved and wanted to marry, he'd be rewarded a thousand times by a happy, complete life. Ah, you know, that's what I was just saying. Army lectures on hygiene had not whetted his appetite <laughs> with their threats of venereal disaster. Um, and this is quite true of today's youth. <laughs> God. Um, you know, I, I, this terrible book is getting me into some terrible trouble talking about some... Uh, some... talking about some... some subjects that if I were to make comments on, I should seriously research and be careful. You know, I don't know. I have opinions on things, but I'm not claiming that they're the most valid or well-researched opinions. So, yeah. And it's going to get worse now. I told you this book is terrible. Whisper Town. Hi, you're with Scott. And we're with Whisper Town. This is part three. And we're going to hear some words now. <laughs> Old Vincent told his son the supply of se seminal fluid was limited and that if he wasted it in riotous living, he'd find himself without the means of producing an heir when time came. So they told him that his cum would run out. The real truth was that Sayer, a young man who lived with no visible tensions, had not been stirred. Modern psychiatrists would have a good deal of profound commenting to make about his relationship with his mother, but neither she nor Sayer had any idea of such a thing and there were no psychiatrists to frighten him to death. Sayer simply wasn't stirred. Then he encountered Lucy Tanner, and the umbilical cord he did not know existed was sharply cut. Lucy Tanner was a lush redhead who worked as hostess in a nightclub, presided over by a conscious carbon copy of Texas Grignon. I don't know. With none of Miss Grignon's... Grignon. G-U-I-N-A-N. Grignon. On the internet, I'm just gonna have a little quick look at G U I N. Some pictures of Whoopi Goldberg there from Star Trek. What are we looking for? Texas. That's my film. Texas. Oh, Texas Guinean quotes prohibition. So this is a real person. And there she is, the queen of nightclubs. Texas Guinean images. I'm learning something new here. Wow, she does look pretty. Or that might be people playing her in a film. Well, no, I'm assuming she does look, look pretty because they've described her as such. There goes Ruby Cam again. So... The Queen of Nightclubs in the Prohibition era, Texas. It's quite. Who is this one? No, that's not her. It's just somebody else. So, anyway, I've got a few different kinds of. But I get the general gist. She's a curly haired flapper style. Yeah. So. She had none of Miss Grignon's real warmth and vitality. In short, this imitation lady was nothing more or less than a madam, and Lucy Tanner, one of the girls. 
On the evening when Lucy Tanner came into Sayers' life, he had a date to go on to a burlesque show with a couple of his classmates. For some long-forgotten reasons, his two friends had been forced to break their date with him at the last minute. <laughs> There's an absolute crap load of pages in this chapter. And, uh, and loads, of, loads of pages in the book as well. <laughs> Reading with Ruby, maybe, uh, unless there is some dramatic call and demand for re reading with Ruby, um, the promises made to complete the book are, will be kept. You know, I'm not going to... I'm going to keep reading with Ruby as well, you know. I like reading with Ruby, but Whisper Town itself, um, I, I, it doesn't always... Background noises um, doesn't always do it for me, and it's not doing it for me tonight, you know. And uh, I can see why it's not my most popular series. But um, I promise I'll be back with more reading with Ruby and with more Whisper Town. It may not be the weekly series that I had envisaged. Uh, and I'm just we're on page 18 at the moment. We've only got up to page. I will edit that out. I dropped something. We've only got up to page 18 so far. So, loads more to come look forward to that but I am going to put a bookmark in that as I can see on the the, the, re the recorder that I've, I've done 37 minutes of reading with Ruby and probably only covered well, one, two, three, four pages so it might be my fault and I might have to just knuckle down and start actually reading the bloody book to you but um, we'll put a little bookmark in it there and let's just get one more shot of Ruby before the end of this so I can show you that there she is oh, oh she's sleeping you can see her anyway can't you throughout, throughout this I might have to crop the sides of the screen off because uh, sometimes getting the bottom of the thing anyway it doesn't matter, does it? It's just one video with some bars on the side that's slightly different from the rest. It, just to whet your appetite, you know, don't go anywhere. Stick with reading with Ruby because I'm just going to open it at random. And we've got page one, two, four. And on this page, um, gosh, I'm happy to say it because the first outcry is directed at you, Miss Winters. You hated him. You were afraid of him. You were, he was going to ruin you. Now eat. So, you know, exciting times are to come. Uh, it sounded like they were bullying a woman, which sounded horrible as well. Um, but, you know, exciting times are to come. I mean, come on, it's got to be better than that last series of Game of Thrones, hasn't it? Predictable, boring nonsense. <laughs> it didn't just say Game of Thrones, and it's really popular. I mean, when you're reading with Ruby, I think I've got one of the fuels as she's sleeping. So, I wonder, uh, it's really fucking hot in here as well. I've got to go and open the doors because I'm literally sweating. But then I'll have to listen to everyone shouting, which will be bad. So, I'm going to take a break and end this video. And, you know, if you've been listening to me to try and get some sleep, I apologise. <laughs> and turn this off and go to bed. Or watch my other video, so. You're my friend. You're my buddy. I got you. It's all good. Good night.